There are certain things that you need, basics, to make bread, sourdough. First of all, the ingredients. I've got my big container here of basically unbleached bread flour. This is the main ingredient that I put in and I add other flours in it. I can use spelt, I can use whole wheat, I can use rye, different ryes. So depending on what I want to do with the bread, just to give it a little bit more texture or flavor. But this is the basic bread flour. And it just comes, we can get it in huge big packets, packets but this is a five kilogram of basic Wallabies Baker's unbleached flour. That's important. You don't really want anything in your flour. Also, just I just use normal iodose salt. Sometimes they'll say use another kind of salt, but I'm a firm believer that we do need to keep iodine in our, our diet. So I just use iodose, iodose salt, olive oil, and of course, the sourdough starter, the mother. Then you need a good bowl to use. The easiest of the utensils. I like to use a knife of this particular spatula because it's just got a smaller blade and it gets into the corners. Very importantly, my kitchen scales. This is important in bread making because it's the ratio, not cups, but it's the actual weights that are important. Different flours have different weights and you want the ratio of water to and mother and flour to come together. So very important, my, the best thing, and I use it every single day, many times. Then you use the, the bread, um, this is a, a, a bowl scraper, which is, as you can see, rounded. So it's easy for me to get into the roundness of my bowl. And this is a bent scraper, so I can cut my loaf if I'm making two, lo two loads. I can also scrape it off of my bench really easily. So this is other, this actually um, vital, I use it all the time. And of course, razor blades. I've got double-edged razor blades. I used to use a knife but they tear the bread when you do it. So you really do need something extremely sharp. And I've seen things, you can split a chopstick and stick it on there so you're not having your hand, but I just use this and I'm very, very careful. So those are the main utensils that you use. Then when it comes to proofing, I have a variety of baskets here. So depending on the shape of the loaf that I'm making, this of course would be a small couple of smaller loaves, um, a round one and or an oblong one that I would use. Baking, pa baking paper is also really important because that's what you put in to line my baskets. You can buy proofing baskets online on eBay, very expensive. I just go to my local whatever, or when I'm traveling with Zegram, if I find a really great basket in one of the markets, I buy one of those for my um, proofing. Then it comes to the baking. So if I'm going to make two loaves, then I use this, and these, as you can see, these will be long, more French bread type of loaf. This is what I use, but more often than not, I use my Dutch oven. And the reason I use my Dutch oven is that it mimics what happens in an actual baker's oven, where they can inject steam into the oven to create the, the crust and the color and the oven spring. I'll talk to you about that when I'm actually making the bread. But this mimics that because it encloses the whole loaf of uh, the old whole loaf of bread, gives it a great big spring, gives it beautiful color, as you'll see at the end of my baking day. So these are the main things that you need. Of course, you can do a variety of all other things according to what you your needs are. Good morning. We've come to the part where we're going to actually make a loaf of bread. It takes two days to put together the ingredients to come out at the day, end of day two with a loaf of bread. Now I know that sounds daunting, but it's actually not daunting at all. Because the actual time that you spend with the bread, with the, the dough, is very minimal as you'll see at the end of it. It just sounds like a lot of time. And you want to think, it's got more about thinking ahead and having planning when you want the bread. You just have to know that the two days before you want the bread, you take the mother out, the starter out of the fridge, you let it acclimatize, and then in the afternoon, you make the pre-ferment, which is what we're going to do now. The pre-ferment is what you do, it's basically the major leaven that's gonna lift the, the flours and the glutens tomorrow when I'm actually making the full bread. 
So this is made, feeding, giving the, the mother a big boost of flour so that it is able then to make the bread rise tomorrow. So that's what we're doing today. We're going to make the pre leaven in the afternoon of the day that I take the bread, the leaven, the starter, out of the fridge. So here is the starter. It's come out of the fridge this morning. Have a look at all the happy bubbles in this mother. Bubbling away, it's got this lovely yeasty, slightly acidic, milky sweet flavoring because it's been fed recently. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put 385 grams into my bowl here. 385 grams. Okay. And then I'll set that aside and feed it later to store. I've already measured up my flowers, so I've got basically, and like you can choose any kinds of flowers you like, but this is the main one, the bread flour. So I've already measured those out, I'm just going to tip those in, together with the water, which I've, again, I've already measured out, so it's 385 grams of the, the starter, 385 grams of flour, and 335 grams of lukewarm water. And... 15 grams of virgin olive oil. Put that aside, mix that all up. And as you can see, it mixes up into just kind of a, a nice, soft, runny dough. And remember, this is not the bread, this is just feeding the leaven so that it's going to have a big, giant boost of food to make it strong enough to leaven more flour that I add to it tomorrow. So that's, that's it, off of the spatula. And then I cover it with a plastic shower cap, A, to save on wasting plastic, but also it keeps it nice and sealed and moist and inside there. I'm going to set it aside and I'll see you tomorrow when I'm ready to make bread in the morning. Thank you. Having started the pre-ferment, so the bread making process, I've removed 385 grams of the mother into that leaven. So my remaining needs to be fed because I need to keep my culture alive. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how I feed it. It's so dead straight. If you make bread once a week like I do, I put it into the fridge just to keep to let it um, retard its growth. Um, but you don't need to. If you're making bread every two or three, four days, then you can just keep feeding it every single day. So there's lots of ways you can feed it. But this is the way I do it. I make bread once a week, once every 10 days. So I put it in the fridge so I don't have to feed it every day, which is a bit of a chore. So all I need to do is I need, and also the, the amounts that I've got is for me, that set it is just enough leaven that I need for my bread making and just enough to keep my, my culture going. You might want to make more bread, you might want to make larger loaves, you might want to make smaller loaves. So you work out your proportions of what you want. I just don't like wasting the mother. So I've got one and a half cups of mixed whole wheat and bread flour in here. And I'm gonna put exactly the same one and a half cups of my mother, this is my main starter, into there. So it's equal amount mother to flour. And as you can see, I have just enough to put in because I have worked out how much I need for my bread making without too much wastage. So there's my one and a half cups. It goes in very easily. You can see the mother is quite, uh, it's got this nice sort of elastic feel to it, look to it, smell to it, it's wonderful. And then one cup, so about two thirds less, about, sorry, about two thirds of a cup for that. So one and a half cups to one cup of lukewarm water goes in, it gets mixed up. So just the mixing of this mother. It's gonna be a happy feeding event for it. 
So once I've got it in to its holding balls here, its holding plastic container, I'm going to leave it out for the rest of the day. And I, what I'll see is towards the end of the afternoon, this is, will have risen about two-thirds up of its container. So you see when I put it in, it's only about a quarter full. So that's giving it its boost. I know that it's happy and alive, and then I stick it into the fridge and it stays in there until I want to make my next loaf of bread. So I'm just going to pour it in here. And again, you can see its consistency is just doughy. There won't be any bubbles because it's just being fed. But I'll show you later on this afternoon how it's grown and how there's bubbles just before I put it into the fridge. So I'll have a little look. See what it looks like now. Not very much in there, and by this afternoon it will be up to this level all bubbly and happy. I left you three and a half hours ago, having just fed the mother. Now you can see that it has actually expanded and grown in the, the bowl, as I said. It's all bubbly and has this wonderful yeasty, sweet, milky kind of aroma out of it. So it's now ready for me to cover it up. I'm not gonna lock it in. What I want it to do is I want it to still breathe, but cover it. So I'm gonna cover it, put it in the fridge, and leave it for the next seven to 10 days before I need to make my next loaf of bread. So if you don't want to frequently make bread, and you want to, say you're going away, for example, and you don't wanna keep having somebody look after your mother or feed it, Although I do do that when I go in, my husband looks after the mother for me. But if we're both going to be gone away, then what I do is I dry it. So this is the remaining that I've got from the, my last feed and from making the bread. And I'm just going to take a little bit, put it on some baking uh, paper here, and you just spread it really thinly. You don't want it thick because you want it to dry. So as you can see how thinly I'm spreading this onto there. And of course, if I was to do this a lot, if I was to be going away, I would do more just to make sure that I've got enough to start my next batch. But just to show you, I'm just going to use a little bit of how I do it. And that's all you need to do is just to spread it very thinly. And then that's going to sit for two, three, four days to completely dry. At the end of it, it will it'll start flaking off and be all dry, but in the middle it still might be a bit wet, so you've got to make sure that it's really dry. And then it will flake off of the pepper, and I'll just put it into a, a baggie, so what it, sometimes I just leave it as flakes, but this has actually been mortared and pestled into a powder so that I can send it to people when they started wanting some, some of my sourdough starter. So essentially that. Then this just goes in the fridge or the freezer. You can choose. I've got some in the freezer. I've got some in the, in the fridge because I was doing a test whether the freezer or the fridge was better. But in fact, it doesn't matter the fridge or the freezer. Same thing. In my instructions, I do have instructions on how to wake this up. So I won't wake it up for you in this particular series, but in the instructions that you will be receiving, if you're interested, you'll have instructions on how to wake it up takes about a week and a half, and that's it. And that's how you can store your mother if you don't want to keep feeding it weekly. So yesterday, in caring for your starter, I talked about drying it. Um, and as you can see, mine's dried really well. It's, I put it on a rack so that it's got some air flowing underneath it to help dry, and that's essentially what you've got at the end of it, is this kind of very thin wafer. And then all I do is break that wafer up into little bits. And I could just store it into a baggie in relatively large cases. It doesn't, you know, really matter. Or, so I've got some here. This is my pieces in my baggie that I put in the freezer. So you can see I just put them into little chips. Or the other thing I can do, and certainly this is the way that I send it in the mail, is I put it into my mortar and pestle and grind it until it's in a powder that looks more like that, more like granulated powder. So that is how you can store your, your sourdough if you're not making it all the time and you wanna make sure that you've got some sourdough when you come back home after traveling for a long time, then you can always just activate your starter and remember that in the instructions, I'll tell you how to wake it all up as well. See you later.